Closures in Rust are a powerful technique for enabling lazy evaluation and capturing variables from their environment. But sometimes it's actually hard to see what is actually really going on. That's why in this video we are going to take a look at closures in Rust and how you can actually use them to your advantage. Now let's just first clarify the question, what are even closures? So basically closures are unnamed functions that can kind of access variables from the scope where they are defined without explicitly being passed as parameters. So you can imagine closures as portable snippets of logic that can carry their context with them. And why should we actually use closures? What is the purpose of them? Well, they do have a few use cases, but one of them is basically event handling and asynchronous programming. The other use case is obviously when you want to allow lazy evaluation, so basically deferring computation until needed. And specifically in Rust, they just enable powerful functional programming techniques with iterators. And a good example of actually using closures in Rust is actually to implement a simple logger. Okay, let's just first demonstrate demonstrate here how we would actually use a logger or our simple logger implementation in Rust. And what we would do is we would define a simple logger here and then we would obviously define the logger, right? And therefore logger has to be a struct so we can define this up here as well, logger. Now and then in the logger itself, maybe we are able to define the level, right? So we might be able to say level and then we say log level, which we will also define in a minute here. And then let's just say info, right? And then we would have like a few functions for this specific struct implementation. So one would be log with, and in here we could define the log level, which will be info, right? So this is the level where the actual log will be printed. And then we will just define the closure in here. And then we say application has started. And then we say to string in here. And for this specific case, obviously this info message will be log because info is greater or equal to info itself, right? So the log level we've defined in the logger struct. And now you might ask yourself, why would you actually use a closure here instead of a simple string, right? Because this would obviously also work. And the reason is quite simple, because if you would just imagine that we have an expensive operation here and the level would be debug, for instance, this expensive operation would still be evaluated. However, if we use a closure, we apply lazy evaluation and some performance optimization, because the closure is only being evaluated whenever the log level matches. Also, the lazy evaluation part with closures has just zero cost abstraction properties. So in the end, the closure overhead is just eliminated at compile time. Right, and to bring this point home, let's just create another kind of log here, but this time we will use the debug log level. And then we are just going to say print line and let's just say hello world here. And I think now it's quite clear that this debug message will never be executed because the bug is less than info, right? And therefore this closure here, we've actually defined in this log with function is never going to be executed. And therefore we just save some performance, right? So let's just quickly implement this logger here. So as I said in the beginning, this struct logger is just a simple struct that just holds a minimum log level, which just shows messages at or above its configured level. And and therefore we're going to say level here and the type of this will be log level and then we can define this enum right so we say enum log level and in here we will use the bug info warn and error right so we define these four enum variants right here that this is the least important one then we have info for just general informational messages then we have warn for just warnings about potential issues and obviously we also have an error here what we will also do above the log level we will also derive the debug the clone the partial equal and then also the partial order so these are just four macros that will be important for us in the future right so we are deriving the partial order and partial equal here to really allow for for comparisons like level is greater or equal to log level info. And with that, we can actually say that it should only show messages that are info level or higher, right? So hopefully this is clear. So let's just implement the logger here with impl logger. And then we are going to define this log with function. So let's just say fn and then log with. Here we are going to say and self, right? We do not want to take ownership of the logger. And then we say message level, which will be log level. And then we also have a function here. So we say f or we name this kind of function f and the type will be f. And this is kind of a generic type parameter we are going to define in a minute. So again, the 
purpose of this function is really to demonstrate the power of closures for lazy evaluation. So why would you actually use a closure here? Instead of just passing a ready-made string, we just pass a closure that can create a string. And the closure only runs if we actually need to log the message. Again, this is really powerful because if generating a log message is an expensive operation, so for example, it just involves complex formatting or data retrieval, we just avoid doing that work entirely if the message isn't going to be logged anyway. Like I said in the beginning, f is going to be a generic type parameter, so we are going to say f here, and this just the declares the generic type parameter. Now we are going to add a really simple trade bound here where we are going to say where, right? This just declares kind of this trade bound for the generic type parameter. And here we are going to say f and then fn and then it returns a string. Right, so here we have fn, which just takes in no arguments. And then we have this string, which just means that this closure or this function should return a string. And again, this overall just means that f must be a type that implements the fn trait. And the fn trait is Rust's way of making real closures and functions callable. So it defines what it means for something to be used like a function. It's important though that if a closure implements this fn trait, it automatically implements fn mod and fn once. And that's actually why this kind of logger will work with any sort of closure type. I'll probably make a separate video just about this fn mod, fn once and fn, but for now hopefully this makes sense here. And oh again this and self just means that we are going to borrow the object temporarily, right, and we do not really take ownership of it. Okay now with this huge explanation here. Let's just check if the message level is going to be greater or equal to the self dot level, right? So only if the message level is greater than or equal to our loggers configured level, we do proceed here with the execution of the closure. So we're going to say let message is equal to f. So we call the closure to actually generate this message. And then we're going to say print line. And in here, we're going to do some formatting magic, right? So we are just kind of formatting the message level into this string here, and then also the message itself. Cool, and this is our log with function. Now, by the way, we are able to do this here, right? We are able to compare the message level with the self dot level of our struct because we actually derive the macros partial equal and partial order, right? And therefore this kind of comparison here is possible. Okay, back to our main function. We're actually going to resolve this issue here because I actually forgot the return value here. So we are going to say this and then to string. And here we're going to say expensive computation. Right, and now the issue is resolved. Okay, and if we are going to run this project now, what we are going to see is first off the info here, Right, which is quite cool. So this is the log level. And then we have application has started. So the closure, the first closure right here is actually going to be executed and evaluated. However, this one right here, because it is a debug level, this closure is never going to be executed. And therefore we save some time and performance. I'm actually going to demonstrate right now another way to actually leverage these closures. And for that, I'm going to demonstrate formatting. So let's just imagine that we have a create formatter function, right? and this takes in a prefix. So we can say user event here, for instance, and then it will return a formatter for us. So user event formatter. Let's just have one more formatter and we are going to call this system event formatter. And instead of the prefix user event, we're going to say system event here. And then we can use a formatted message, for instance, or we can declare this format message one to be user event formatter. And then we can say user logged in. And then we have a formatted message two, and we're going to leverage the system event formatter here. And let's just say database connection established. And then in the end, we are just going to print line these two messages here, right? So hopefully it is clear what is actually going to happen or what is actually going to be the output of these two messages. So we have the prefix here, right? So it should print a prefix. And then every time we kind of log with this formatter something, this prefix is going to be reused. So let's just create this create formatter function. We're going to say fn create formatter. And this just takes in a prefix, right? Which will be of type reference string. And it returns an implementation of a function that is kind of callable, right? It takes in a reference string and then it returns a string, right? And here with this function, I actually want to demonstrate closure factories, which are just functions that create and return closures. In this specific case, it just takes a prefix string and returns a closure that captures this prefix, right? So what we can say is let owned prefix, and then we're going 
going to say prefix or to string. And then we're going to kind of return this closure here, right? So we're going to say return string and it takes in a message here, which is of type reference string. Now remove the semicolon here in the end to actually return this closure. And then we're going to use the move keyword here. I'm actually going to explain what is really going on in a minute. But what we'll say here is just format. And then we do some simple formatting here. We use the owned prefix and then we also use the message. So right here the move keyword just transfers the ownership of the owned prefix variable into the closure and now the closure kind of owns the owned prefix and can use it even after the create formatter function has finished executing, right? So this own prefix will be used every single time we actually call for instance, this user event formatter or this system event formatter. In this case, the system event formatter will use the own prefix system event and the user event formatter will use the prefix user event. Now again, this move keyword is used to force the closure to take ownership of prefix in this case. This is kind of important because the return closure will outlive the create formatter function scope, so it needs its own copy of the prefix data. And therefore, each return closure has its own copy of the data it actually needs. The specific return type here, this implementation function, just means we are returning some type that actually implements the fn trade for a closure that takes a reference string and returns a string. And this reference string is just a kind of string slice, so a reference to string data that's owned by something else. Now you might wonder why don't we actually use the prefix here directly and instead just declare a new own prefix. The reason is quite simple because the compiler would then generate a lifetime error because the return closure actually would contain a dangling reference to prefix that kind of no longer exists after the function returns. And because obviously when the closure is returned from the create formatter function, it just needs to be self-contained and on all the data it actually uses. And since prefix is a bold reference, it doesn't really own the underlying string data. And if the closure tried to capture prefix directly, Rust Power Checker would just prevent this because the closure would outlive the scope where prefix is valid. So Rust is really fun, right? So let's just test this program right here because now all the errors are actually gone. So let's just say cargo run. And what we'll see here is info application has started, right? This is our first closure usage. And then we have the closure factory again with the user event and system event by just defining two different formatters here. And we actually see that things work, right? So we have the prefix user event and system event and then the message itself. Because this create formatter just returns the closure, right? And we can use this indefinitely and it will use this prefix every single time we try to log something with this system event formatter, for instance. Now, hopefully you've learned a few things right here and that's basically everything you need to know about closures, at least for now. Now, if you are curious about the difference between the two most commonly used string types in Rust, feel free to check out this video here. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.